mine have to be when I finally got to sleep in this weekend. Just waking up and looking at the clock and then going back to sleep. <laughs> so the image was the clock. Yes. Yeah. And, and what time was it? What time was it telling like you? Nine thirty-nine. Yeah. And, and then it jumps up to ten thirty. Right. And then like in a few seconds. And it's just oh, you know, trying to assess what time it is. Yeah. Is it late? Is it er too early to get up? Is it early enough that I'll be happy to get up this early because I'll then have another chunk of time. I've been missing out on the early chunks of time lately mm -hmm. and feeling kind of grumpy about that. <laughs> I don't want to get up at 8. I want to get up at 6 and I'm happy to get up at 6. It's hard to tell with the really early yeah. morning light. What time is it? Mm -hmm. And then you have to fight with yourself. Oh, should I just go back to sleep till I wake up? That's wonderful, though, that without looking at a clock, you're just trying to assess the light, how much light is coming through the window. And yeah. if it's in a room you're used to sleeping in, you, you're, you can do it pretty accurately, can't you, as the seasons progress. I've been changing rooms every night this last week, and so I wake up and say, where am I? <laughs> you know, why is the bed, why is my head looking at this instead of what I see at home? But that's my first visual uh, feeling of being lost. Mm -hmm. Two men up, up fixing the house, building the on a, on a new house, one of which I know and one of which was a neighbor that I hadn't met. And um, it was a beautiful image just because of the light and the beautiful day, unexpected November day. And before analyzing it, as you said, or started to put meaning to it, it was just, it just felt like a strong image of building and, and um, camaraderie. Mm -hmm. And then after I started thinking about men and how they express their emotions or don't, and then working together, <laughs> it was just a, it was just a really positive, nice, nice yeah. image. Yeah, great. Okay. So images are essential for poetry. They're they're the if, if carpenters use wood uh, to build a chair, poets use images to build a poem. And sometimes. Um, a lot of what we said, some of you just said, well, this is the image, and you didn't go beyond that. And often, that's what a poem is made of. It's the image without it flipping into an idea. The idea is embedded within the image, and the poet decides that nothing else needs to be said. That is probably most prevalent in haiku, right? Um, where they do other things in haiku as well, but the Japanese masters sometimes just gave us images um, I'll give you one of my favorites by Issa, I-S-S-A, um, 19th century haiku master. Dear licking, first frost from each other's coats. Dear licking, first frost from each other's coats. Does that make you feel wonderful? <laughs> and it's just a description. And you presume that the poet probably saw that at one point. Here's another one from Issa. Naked on a naked horse in pouring rain. <laughs> naked on a naked horse in pouring rain. And another one, one human being, one fly in a large room. <laughs> <laughs> one human being, one fly in a large room. And one by Basho, who was before Isa, I think he does a little bit of a jump here, but it would be hard to define how he does it. The winter leaks have they washed white. How cold it is. The winter leaks have they washed white. How cold it is. It's almost, they become almost a metaphor for winter themselves, right? But not quite. They're doing something a little sneakier than, than metaphor. Um, here's one that I think is pure image from Chekhov's notebooks. They undress the corpse but had no time to take off the gloves. A corpse in gloves. Now it leads us to think various things as well as see it, but first we have to see it. Probably my favorite haiku in the world, if one can be said to have one, is from um, Busan, and it goes like this. It's about a snail. One horn short, one long. What's on its mind? <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> one horn short, one long. What's on its mind? And I think the leap between the observation is just an amazing one. It, it's the kind of leap that makes sparks fly. Like, how did he get 
from looking at this snail. And I imagine this big man on his knees, or maybe even his belly, just staring at this snail and noticing, you know, the difference in length of the horns, and then whew, what's on its mind. Yeah, marvelous. A whole universe is created in that jump that he makes to that question. And then I think this one is by Isa again. And it goes like this. And, and there's, I think there's a marvelous symbology in this, but it's also just a simple thing one could see. The man in the radish field pointed the way with the radish. <laughs> the man in the radish field pointed the way with the radish. Mm -hmm. So even if that were all we did, if we became a master of images, we would be pretty fine writers. And E.E. E. Cummings said, never mind you know, wanting to write one great poem. Maybe in your whole life, you might write one great image. Mm -hmm. And you should pat yourself on the back you know, just for doing that. Um, Frederico Garcia Lorca, the Spanish poet, said that a poet must be a professor of the five senses. A poet must be a mm -hmm. professor of the five senses. And Wallace Stevens said that every poet must have a peasant in him or her. There must be a bit of the peasant in every poet. And again, I think what he means by that is you've got to get out there and get your hands in the earth and smell the air and notice the kinds of things that we were all noticing today. Um, T.S. Eliot, in writing about D.H. Lawrence's animal poems, and I hope you've read them. If not, they're a treat ahead of you. He's sometimes known for Lady Chatterley's Lover and Sons and Lovers for his novels, but he was a very, very, very fine poet. And uh, Eliot said that what you notice about his poetry is that he was a poet who paid rapt attention to things. And that's a skill that we have to learn if we want to be writers. Uh, we don't have to be geniuses. As Raymond Carver said, we don't have to be even the smartest person on the block. We just have to pay attention to things and look at things in a way that a Basho or an Isa or a Busan did in their lifetimes. And just their attentiveness created very, very fine poetry. <laughs>